Uh, glad to have you all here, especially welcome our uh, out-of-town guests, uh, some of whom we'll be hearing from uh, later today. Um, this uh, event on the Syriac Christian Churches is um, obviously a, a very timely historical uh, subject given uh, the, the crisis in the Middle East and uh, the violence particularly against uh, Middle Eastern Christians and other uh, religious minorities in, in the Middle East. Uh, it's a troubling subject in, in many ways, but obviously uh, highly pertinent uh, to what's going on in our world today. And, and that is the sort of thing that we certainly like to do um, at, at the Institute for Studies of Religion. We platform uh, a lot of topics and research on, on religion that's going on at Baylor. Uh, as you likely know, Baylor is the sort of place that uh, across many different departments, not only the religion department and Truett Seminary, uh, but many departments, his, history, sociology, philosophy, uh, and others have uh, many scholars who are working on different topics and areas of religion. And so the Institute for Studies of Religion is a, is a kind of a uh, meeting place, a clearinghouse, place to, to platform uh, all the excellent research that's going on across the disciplines at, at Baylor in the study of uh, religion. And uh, at least a year or two ago, uh, Philip Jenkins and I started talking about the idea of doing an event like this on the Eastern Churches. Um, and uh, Philip and I, uh, for a number of years now, have uh, co-directed ISR's program on historical studies of, of religion. Um, and we began planning, uh, partly with uh, these news events in mind, that it would be so important to do uh, an event like that, and so that's what what brings us here today. Um, if you have uh, one of the flyers, it has the schedule uh, for the day. All the presentations are, are going to be uh, in here, uh, and we certainly understand if you can only make uh, some uh, of the presentations and be delighted if you can come to uh, all of them, but you want to uh, check out the, the subjects for uh, all of today's presentations. Um, I do want to introduce uh, my colleague, Philip Jenkins. Uh, he, he doesn't need too much of an introduction, I suspe suspect, for uh, many of you. But as I said, uh, he and I co-direct ISR's program on historical studies of religion. He is also a distinguished professor of history in, in Baylor's history department. Um, and he has written uh, many, many books. Uh, I, I've always said I think Philip has one of the most extraordinary CVs I've ever seen in academia. Uh, he has written on many, many different subjects uh, from uh, 17th century English political history uh, to the history of pop culture in the United States in the 1970s uh, to uh, the history of Eastern uh, churches. <laughs> and so uh, Philip is going to bring to us uh, part of his uh, vast expertise uh, in many different subjects by speaking uh, this morning about looking East in Christian history. Philip. By the way, uh, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kidd there um, ha uh, uh, also has a, uh, a Vita and a list of publications, which is becoming terrifying. So um, <laughs> all I can say is whippersnapper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with uh, in two capacities right now. So I'm here as the um, uh, the MC, and I'll be uh, in giving introductions and uh, so on. Um, but I, I, I'm also giving a, a, a presentation shortly. I was sort of in two minds about uh, uh, doing that, as I'll, I'll explain uh, in a moment. Um, as uh, Tommy said, uh, we looked at the situation a couple of years ago and the uh, dreadful uh, fates that were uh, overtaking Christian communities with names like the Assyrians and the Chaldeans and so on in the Middle East. And I think we were both very struck by how little people recognized these names or knew who they were and recognized just how incredibly important they were in Christian history. And if you want to know anything about Christian history and you, are not, uh, you don't know about these groups, oh, you are missing so much of the story. And so we, uh, we, we got together this uh, uh, conference, and um, it is such uh, a 
a privilege being in something like um, ISR because what you can do is you can draw up a wish list of people and events and you can actually do it. Mm -hmm. It's like being unleashed in the candy store. Uh, and um, at uh, Baylor, we have these two wonderful uh, Syriac uh, uh, scholars, uh, uh, Abjad and uh, uh, Abdul Masi Saadi, uh, who we'll be uh, hearing from. And we were also able to invite in two um, absolute world class uh, scholars. Uh, if I decide to intimidate you, uh, I'll list some of the languages they actually command. I know it drives me into a, a great sense of, uh, uh, of humility. Um, but what, what I'm going to do, uh, and I'm going to change hats here and move into, uh, 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 into speaker uh, mode, um, I, I, I'm going to do a talk called Looking East uh, in Christian History, which is to provide a framework for what we'll be looking at uh, uh, today. Um, I will ask my more specialist uh, colleagues not to snicker too much while I'm talking, and bear with me, uh, but uh, one of the important things here is that there is a geographical dimension to this story which is really remarkable and really unexpected. We, we've been talking about the Middle East, and oh brother, the story goes way uh, beyond that. Let me just start with uh, an image, if I can get it, which, let me emphasize this, is not connected directly with the Syriac churches but it's just an image I, um, I often uh, use. And I sometimes ask uh, people uh, to guess or to deduce what that building is. And pretty obviously, it's uh, something um, ecclesiastical. And you think, hmm, it's a monastery, it's a church, it's a cathedral. And of course, it's none of the above. It's a mosque. Because uh, it's in uh, Cyprus, it's in uh, uh, Famagusta, and uh, it is an example of, it's the only example in the world of a medieval Gothic cathedral uh, that was taken over to become a, a mosque. And the reason I'm showing that is to make a, and if you look, you'll see the clue uh, way up at the top right, um, which uh, indicates that it, uh, that it is a mosque. Um, and it makes a basic point that is what we think of as the Islamic world today most of it, much of it, was once the, not just the Christian world, but the heart of the, uh, uh, the Christian world. And the transition, how the one became the other, is uh, very important. Well, I suppose this is not a very um, imposing uh, image in its own right, and it looks like um, a pile of mud, and that's not far off. Uh, that's actually the remains of a city by the name of Merv, M-E-R-V, or Meru, uh, which is in uh, Turkmenistan in uh, Central Asia. Uh, the city is, uh, you know, it's kind of quite uh, uh, evocative. It has a couple of uh, dramatic uh, buildings. But uh, the reason it is important, and if you're interested in Christian history, that you really should know about it, is at its height in the early Middle Ages, it was almost certainly the most populous city on the planet. More people lived there than any other city, Merv, M-E-R-V, Meru. Um, and it was also a key center of Christian scholarship. It was uh, a place where uh, Christian scholars uh, gathered, and they undertook one of the main tasks in Christian history, which is, and I, I borrow a phrase here from my colleague, uh, Lamin Sane, you know what the original language of Christianity is? Translation. Christianity was born in translation. And what they did in, um, in Merv, uh, which was not run by Christians, but it had this great collection of Christian scholarship, was they, um, they took all the works of Christianity, all the great works of Christianity from all the great Christian languages, uh, uh, Greek, Syriac, Coptic, and they tried to translate them into the languages that they would need to go and convert the rest of East Asia. To convert China was always the great prize. 
yeah, Greek, Syriac. I think they even found about two Latin books to translate. But as we all know, Latin didn't produce anything worthwhile in, uh, <laughs> in Christian scholarship. And so it's just the major languages. And if you think that's a, um, a cheap joke, well, yes, it is. Uh, but it also reflects a common mm. perception in the East that everything that mattered happened in the East Mediterranean and points east. And yeah, we hear there are some guys out there like, do you know somebody called Augustine or something like this? But they didn't really register that much. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's look at these, uh, who some of these communities were. And uh, you can see they're the holy city of Jerusalem. That's from a uh, late antique uh, mosaic. And of course, the whole story begins, the Christian story begins in uh, Jerusalem. And as we all know, uh, the story spreads west. Uh, it spreads into um, what we call Asia Minor and uh, Greece and uh, uh, Italy. And we get the story in the book of Acts. And then we know how that uh, story moves into the Middle Ages as uh, Christians move into France and Spain and Germany and Britain. And then finally, there's a great leap across the Atlantic. And then it reaches uh, uh, Waco, Texas, and that's the end of the story. Yeah. And then it's uh, uh, roll credits, uh, uh, end of film. All of which is true. Um, but at the same time the Christianity was spreading west, it was also spreading south and east in exactly the same centuries, and in many ways just as powerfully. And I'm just letting uh, Dr. Kidd know that uh, the next conference uh, uh, we'll be doing on this will be Looking South, which is about the churches in, uh, in Africa. Uh, but at the moment, uh, I want to look at this great expansion to the East by people who are, they're not Christians. They're Nazarenes. They're the Nasrani. Uh, and that is a truly ancient uh, name. Uh, and in the uh, early centuries uh, of the church, they spread east very fast. I do not know when the first Christians gaze on the Pacific. I think it's in the third century, maybe the, uh, uh, maybe the fourth, um, but it's a very early uh, story. I also want to tell you a story that you've, uh, you've never heard before. As Christians were uh, expanding, they were able to take advantage of a great empire, uh, a great multinational empire that had uh, many cities, it had built uh, uh, mighty uh, roads, it had uh, uh, great armies. Uh, Christians spread very widely through this, uh, through this empire. They established their bishoprics and their uh, metropolitans uh, through this empire. Um, and they were able to spread because of the relative peace that the empire uh, had brought. The empire persecuted them on occasion, but they, they survived. And when the empire died away, all the great cities that they had settled became great Christian bishoprics. And you're thinking, this man Jenkins is an idiot. This is a story we've heard a hundred times. It's about the Roman Empire. Yes, it is. But it's also about the Persian Empire. And the great, there are basically three great empires in Eurasia. You have the Roman, you have the Persian, you have the Chinese. And just at the same time as the Christians are spreading west through the, uh, through the Roman Empire, they're also spreading east through the Persian, uh, through the Persian Empire. And their, their influence there is, is strange. They, they have a remarkable lot of um, power and influence despite persecution. There, there's a rather wonderful story which um, I believe, but my colleagues may, may uh, uh, correct me on this, that when the last of the uh, Persian emperors, the last of the Persian kings, uh, uh, dies in the, uh, the seventh century, when his empire has been overthrown by the Muslims, the last person is, who's with him is a Christian bishop. Um, there are Christian bishops to the east. Um, do not attempt to navigate by this map, please. Um, and you might be looking at this and thinking, they weren't very good about maps in the Middle Ages. Well. Actually, they had two sorts of maps. They had like charts for detailed work, which was superb. And they also had these symbolic maps. And I just want to draw your attention to this. This is a way in which people thought symbolically of the world in the, through most of the Middle Ages and the early modern period. At the heart of the world always is Jerusalem, uh, where Christ made his, uh, 
his sacrifice. And then you have Europe and Africa and Asia as those three leaves of a, I don't know, a three-leafed clover. And you'll notice that in that vision, the three are sort of uh, equal. And I would suggest to you that as a way of contemplating Christian history, there is a lot to be said for this. As I said, if you look at the church in the early Middle Ages, that is a pretty fair reflection that it's in Europe and Asia and Africa. The Asia and the Africa wings obviously faded and uh, died away, so we were left with one leaf. But now in our own time, the great churches of Africa and Asia are coming back. So I can summarize Christian history uh, to you very easily. Christianity is a religion that was born in Africa and Asia and in our lifetimes has decided to go home. You'll also note that uh, in this map, uh, you have this perfect uh, threefold division. And then some damn fool has gone and discovered America, and what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and the uh, answer is, you have this here with, you know, not really here, do not notice this honestly, but we'll figure out a way to put it in some way down the road. But that, it, it's, it's an interesting way of kind of reconceiving Christian history, because so much of the story we always tell is one of westward movement, it's of Europe, it's uh, of America, and it reflects that long period from basically about the 15th century through to the 20th, which is sometimes rudely called the North Atlantic captivity of the church. And the more we look at the church today expanding in Africa and Asia, the more we realize we've been here before, that we are retreading these ancient grounds. Oh, and the other thing is so many of the issues uh, that we face today absolutely for the first time, like the issue of, oh my God, Christians meet Buddhists, what on earth happens? And this has never happened before apart from about a thousand years. And uh, we realize that we shouldn't be uh, reinventing the, uh, the wheel on this, that there are all these great, uh, great lessons. I'm going to be very rude to this uh, map, which uh, is in many ways, it's a, it's a very fine map. But I sometimes use it uh, under the title, How to Lie with Maps. Or how to mislead somewhat with maps, and I'll tell you why. This map uses as its framework the Mediterranean world and the Roman Empire. That's logical. It's a map of uh, the spread of uh, Christianity in the Roman Empire up to the, uh, uh, the 5th century. It's perfectly fine. But the fact you're framing it this way immediately frames, sends a message that nothing else can be happening off the map. And if it's not happening off the map, then there's no need to map it. So it's a, a vicious, uh, vicious cycle. My Lord, this is a very geometric presentation today. Um, and it's, it's absolutely true as far as it goes. But just suppose I was to show that map differently, and I took all that information, what's happening in Europe and Africa, but I extended it all the way to India, for example. And as it is, that's looking at the Roman Empire, fine, that part off to India is not the, um, is not the Roman Empire, but it's where Christianity is spreading. Christianity is spreading uh, at this point, by the 5th century, it's certainly entering into what we would call Central Asia. It's certainly entering into Persia. It's, um, it is pushing um, far east. And I just want to particularly draw your attention. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm under um, uh, strict orders not to wander uh, 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 too far uh, here. But if you look at those eastern areas, excuse me, um, here in what is now um, northern Syria and uh, southeastern Turkey that is going to be such a core area of what we are uh, what we're talking about if I chose a random date if uh, say in the fifth or sixth century if you wanted to look for the intellectual spiritual cultural hearts of Christianity you would look in Egypt you would look in Syria and you would look in those areas to, uh, 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 to the north. Uh, 
Uh, yes, many things are happening in Italy, they're happening in Africa, they're happening in Gaul, but the center of the action, so much of the center of the story is uh, where I'm saying. And it's, um, it's not in Latin. Um, don't, don't forget, th this is the point at which um, when, when people start uh, talking, um, by, by, by the time you get into the, I don't know, 6th, 7th centuries, when people start using the phrase, oh, you speak the Roman language, what they actually mean is Greek. And that's an interestingly different way of presenting uh, our story. And that presents the, um, the two empires. You've got the Byzantine Empire, which, of course, no one at the time ever calls the Byzantine Empire. They always called the Roman Empire. And you've got this thing called the Sassanid Persian Empire. And I ask you to look at that map because it provides as good a framework for understanding Christianity to the east as the map of the Roman world does to the West. You know, we've lost an empire here. Um, and if you look at that red line crossing uh, the empire that runs from Syria deep into Asia, it's a little bit misleading. It's called the Silk Route. Now, in a lot of books these days, we sort of imagine that as if it's an early med uh, medieval I-35. And no, it's not a road, it's a series of routes, it's a series of roads, it's a series of tracks, but people know roughly where they're, uh, where they're going. And it connects the, um, the, the Middle East to the great lands which are the sources of, uh, uh, of silk in, um, uh, in China. And that route passes through a series of uh, cities, and you'll note that I've got uh, Merv uh, uh, on that map right uh, up to the border, uh, and Samarkand and a great many others. And early Christianity spreads into that empire, and particularly um, along that route. So just as you can't understand Christianity in Western Europe without looking at the map of the old Roman cities and roads, ditto for the, uh, 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 for the east. If you want to understand, uh, if you want to get a concept of that uh, that world, where what are they called? Oh yeah, the Nazarenes are spreading. Think of uh, sorry, we'll just uh, move on. Okay, this is a uh, this is a map of kind of the heartland of the story. Now uh, these days, whenever you see a map like that, you know very bad things are happening. This is uh, a map which is associated with all the horrors of the civil war in Syria, the war in uh, Iraq. Uh, increasing chaos in, um, in parts of uh, Turkey. I would draw your attention to that and suggest that uh, um, at many points in history, that is the heartland of Christianity. It's where, uh, the, it's the heartland of the churches that we will be uh, looking at uh, today. You'll notice in the center of the, um, of the map, you have the two great centers of Edessa and uh, Nisibin. Um, but there are a great many other uh, stories of that. I, I, I sometimes say that if you want to uh, look at a history of, um, of that world, there's a triangle you can draw from Jerusalem here, Antioch there, and to, well, one of these. Uh, Seleucia Ctesiphon was the, uh, the capital of the Sassanid Empire, and quite, uh, uh, that's quite near what is now uh, uh, Baghdad, or what would become uh, Baghdad. Um, and that is the uh, heartland where so much of the, uh, the writing, the scholarship that we're uh, talking about uh, today um, was produced from a very, uh, very, very early point. Uh, it is a land which is extremely rich in uh, churches, uh, in monasteries, um, and it's very hard for me to think of a, a parallel, and my original degree uh, is in uh, Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic, and what that meant was um, I did uh, a lot about Ireland. Uh, Ireland where here's a monastery, here's a monastery, what's between it? Why, yes, another monastery. <laughs> um, and th that's very true about this landscape um, in this era. Uh, I if you read some of the uh, sources from like the 9th century, uh, not just do we read about the famous great monasteries, but it's absolutely clear that monasteries and churches uh, are everywhere. And I would suggest that that is reasonably true from, what, the 4th century, certainly up to the 13th and the 14th 
no big period, just a thousand years, just half of Christian history. And many of those monasteries survive until the 20th century and to the last few years. And some of the greatest of those monasteries have perished, have been destroyed, uh, their occupants have been driven out within the last decade. It's so much of being the, the end of this uh, story. My colleagues may disagree with me. Personally, I, uh, I honestly wonder if Christianity at all will survive in Syria and Iraq within um, another few years. And that's a, uh, that's a nightmare. But, uh, and it's so much more a nightmare when you realize what the, uh, uh, what the history was and how pivotal um, that was. Some of these uh, astonishing uh, monasteries that you get in this uh, region, and also uh, a very large body of um, Syriac, uh, of Syriac writing, of, um, of Syriac uh, scholarship. I don't want to talk about that right now because, as I said, my, my colleague's going to be talking about these things at great, uh, at great length. Uh, and from the fourth and fifth centuries, Christians set out on these great uh, ventures, some of which are deliberately missionary, some are not. Some are just people go to a particular area, they are Christians, they build churches, they develop churches uh, around them, so not necessarily constantly uh, missionary, but if you follow the great uh, uh, trade routes, and uh, you, you'll see some of these uh, uh, places uh, with uh, very, uh, very exotic uh, names. You'll see uh, Merv, you'll see uh, Samarkand and uh, uh, Kashgar. And uh, over, as we get into uh, China, you'll see names like uh, Dunhuang, uh, a great center where many roots uh, come together, where in uh, modern times, that is the 19th, 20th centuries, some of the most astonishing and uh, complete records have been found of these different churches and of other groups. And the, the first thing you realize when you look at these is the extreme diversity uh, that Christians are dealing with. Seriously, these are towns where you can have a Christian monastery here. Literally down the road, you can have a Buddhist monastery, and you can have a Manichaean community here. Um, and usually they're not under the domination of any one of those. And we have, a, <coughs> we have reasonably good evidence that they are talking to each other to some extent. It's not just, you know, can we borrow a cup of wine? Uh, the, 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 that there is a serious interchange uh, going on. And for a long time, it is highly uncertain whether many part, uh, areas like this are going to be Christian or Buddhist or Manichaean or as would eventually happen, uh, Muslim. But that Muslim conversion is not a done deal in that Central Asian area until the 13th, 14th, 15th century. It's, uh, it's late, in the, uh, late in the story. And so much of it depends on chance, uh, as, as I'll be explaining similar, uh, similar map. Yeah, this is, um, you have a very senior rank in the Eastern Church. Uh, which is called Metropolitan. Okay, uh, it is above um, uh, uh, Archbishop. One, one of the funny things that uh, uh, when the uh, uh, British missionaries come to the Eastern churches in the 19th century, they have a real problem, which is, oh, I am sent here by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the head of the Anglican Church. And what they don't realize is in the Eastern churches, they have this great hierarchy from bishops to archbishops and um, all the way up to metropolitans and patriarchs. So an archbishop is uh, uh, basically the guy who holds the door open. <laughs> say, oh, you're maybe sent by an archbishop. Well, you know, if you ever deal with someone important, tell us immediately. Um, but the, the metropolitans were the very senior people uh, in the church uh, of the East. And uh, look where they are located. Look at the uh, high concentration in what we would today call um, Iraq, in uh, southeastern Turkey, in uh, north Syria. Um, uh, and, um, and this um, area, and they're, they're every one of those uh, just sends out uh, so many uh, different stories, uh, so many of those are uh, major sees, bishoprics for uh, many 
many centuries they produce these great scholars. But look where some of the others are. Look at the ones in Central Asia. Look at the ones in Bukhara, Merv, Samarkand, Kashgar, Khotan. Uh, they, they are in what we today would call the stans, the, uh, like Turkmenistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example. Um, and uh, look at the eastern ones. Look at the ones in, uh, well, that's, a, that's a late one. That's Kanbalik. That's, uh, that would be 13th century. Um, it's um, round about the year 800 where the head of the Church of the East, the Patriarch Timothy, um, has a great habit of doing throwaway lines in his letters, and he's doing his review of the year. You know, think of it as the uh, state of the church address. And he said, well, it's been a busy year. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I've appointed uh, metropolitans for the Turks, who at this point are, I, I don't reach that high, way at the top of the map, way off in Central Asia, probably somewhere around Lake Baikal, and the Tibetans. And yeah, there's a metropolitan for Tibet. Um, anyone want to talk about globalization here? And this is the uh, uh, this is the ninth century. How late that whole process uh, goes on is up for debate. We know that around about the year 1500, just as uh, you know, Columbus is uh, setting off for um, America. Uh, we know that the Church of East is sending missions to Java, which is off the map that way. And there's a lot of debate about how far they go in different uh, countries. There are claims, claims, um, that they reach into Japan, Korea. Uh, very, very questionable, but uh, uh, at, at least, um, at least, somewhat uh, worth uh, considering. I'm, I'm cheating here, as my colleagues know, uh, because these these are actually Manichaean scribes. Uh, but it, it, it does give a nice idea of these uh, all these scholars in uh, Central Asia uh, writing. I've used the phrase the Church of the East. What uh, what was it? Um, back in the early centuries of the Church, uh, Church loyalties were very closely aligned with national and imperial uh, bodies. Um, so the, uh, the patriarchates within the Roman Empire had their relationship with the Roman Empire, but what about the ones beyond the border? Um, the ones within the Persian Empire became aligned with, uh, uh, with uh, Persia, and uh, theological differences also entered in. From the 5th century, there were these great splits within the church over what's sometimes called Nestorianism, which is a heresy over the, um, the nature of, uh, of Christ, the one nature, two nature things. Um, and the uh, Eastern Church adopted positions that the West thought were Nestorian. You notice I'm phrasing that so elaborately, and I'm doing it in a particular way because in relatively modern times, again, 19th, 20th centuries, um, we actually have a major book by, Nestor, uh, by Nestorius, who's the alleged founder of Nestorianism, the great villain in church history. And it's absolutely clear that uh, he was not a Nestorian. Hmm. And he denounces uh, these, uh, these views. Um, that's actually a whole, uh, whole story in its own right. Uh, Nestorius was uh, you know, condemned from his office for his terrible heresies. Uh, much of which consisted of really annoying, very powerful Egyptian churchmen. Um, and he then vanishes from history, and presumably he, you know, he f meets the fate of all heretics, that he's you know, eaten by snakes or something. Um, and then this text <laughs> ended up in the 19th century, which is by him, and he's basically live-blogging all the church councils of the day. And he has the most perfect life in history, and I mean that, because he lived to see all his old enemies dead or disgraced, and he can't beat that. <laughs> uh, but when you talk about the Nestorian church, please remember it really isn't Nestorian. Uh, it has different, it phrases things differently. But anyway, it's the Church of the East. It is based in the uh, uh, Persian imperial capital, Seleucia Ctesiphon, um, and uh, later on, when that city is closed down and the Persians move their capital to Baghdad, it has its heart in, um, uh, uh, in Baghdad uh, for uh, many centuries. Um, and 
Baghdad for those centuries thus becomes the center for this incredible Christian world, which in terms of uh, area and almost certainly population uh, dwarfs the European Christianity of the time. If you tell the story of Christianity in the early Middle Ages and you just tell it in terms of, we cover the whole story from Ireland to Poland, well, you're missing a real lot. And maybe even, as I say, the, uh, uh, the heart of the uh, story. Um, technically, uh, the idea of having that patriarch there, it was in Baghdad, but they always called themselves of Babylon because that was the ancient uh, name. That was going to cause a lot of uh, confusion in later centuries when European explorers got to India and they reached southern India about 1500 and they met all these uh, Christians and said, what Christians are you? Well, you know, we're, we're the ancient church, we're the true church, obviously. <laughs> well, um, we've been sent by the Pope in Rome. Well, we've never heard of him. We follow the patriarch in Babylon. <laughs> um, this was uh, very puzzling for later Christians. Yeah, um, if you ever, uh, I, I've mentioned this man, uh, Timothy, by the way, uh, the, the patriarchs have a, uh, a very long, distinguished uh, record. Uh, Timothy is just this multiply fascinating character. He's around the year uh, 800. We have quite a lot of his um, correspondence. And he just tells these uh, uh, great stories which indicate what a radically different world uh, that he's living in from the contemporary Western church. Um, and some of the stories are, are uh, quite famous, so bear with me if I'm uh, repeating this. But so he throws out this story, which is, well, you know, we've been spending a lot of time here looking at the manuscripts, looking at these scrolls. Uh, so recently, this is the year 800, a, um, uh, a converted Jew uh, was telling us about the new scrolls they found in the Judean desert. Hello. Um, and we've been working through them to see how they compare with the uh, Masoretic text of the, uh, uh, of the Bible and so on. We're working uh, w with uh, the Jews on this. And this is at a time when Europe, if you gave them a, a Hebrew scroll, they wouldn't know which way up to hold it. And they're working very hard on this tight textual Hebrew uh, evidence. Um, this is a church that is certainly separated from Judaism, but is still in dialogue with, uh, uh, with Judaism and, uh, and Hebrew um, origins. Round about the year 800 also, something interesting is happening um, further, uh, further east. Um, Timothy's not directly uh, connected with it, but it's a rather nice story. And I tell it because it reflects the scale, the diversity of this world. I want to introduce you to the world's worst missionary. This is a man who is a Buddhist missionary who leaves India carrying vast quantities of Buddhist uh, scriptures, and he makes his long, long way up to the then capital of uh, China. And he wants to uh, spread the knowledge of Buddhism in a country that's accepted Buddhism, but could, you know, could need, could use uh, uh, more. Why do I say he's the world's worst missionary? Because he's neglected something. He doesn't speak any of the languages that he needs. Okay? Um, so what do you do if you have this vast horde of wonderful Buddhist manuscripts and sutras and scriptures? and no one can read them and no one can understand them. Well, obviously, you just go knock on the door of the local Christian bishop. So, excuse me, can you help me translate this stuff? Certainly. And so they spend about a decade, the Christian and the Buddhist, translating all these manuscripts into the languages that they will need in, uh, uh, in China. And those manuscripts have a long kind of afterlife. They're very influential in Chinese Buddhism. And there are a number of Japanese Buddhists in town at the time, and they take those home to Japan. And a lot of Japanese Buddhist schools rely on those manuscripts that at many, many points display the fingerprints of the Christian bishop. <laughs> bishop Adam. It all begins with, uh, uh, with Adam. There's a lot of debate about how good the translations are, but for our purposes, it's irrelevant. But think about that, and if any of you want to go write a historical novel, this is it. Mm. You know, the life of, um, the life of Bishop Adam. <laughs>
And uh, I mentioned the idea of the, um, you know, the contact between uh, religions. If you want to get an idea of that, for centuries in different parts of Asia, the Church of the East used as symbol a merged cross and lotus. The cross, of course, is the symbol of Christianity. It's the defeat of uh, sin. And the lotus represents uh, the defeat of ignorance. Just imagine if your church today suggested, we're going to merge these Christian and Buddhist symbols. And I think that you, know, you would not make yourself popular for multiple centuries, probably at this point, the greatest church in the world decided to do so. Nobody particularly cared. Use these uh, Buddhist uh, symbols. It's a, it's a Mongolian uh, Nestorian cross. You see the uh, uh, the lotus, uh, the lotus and the cross. And uh, yeah, and uh, this is also um, an interesting thing. Back in the 16th century, in uh, China, they dug up this object, this big carved stone. And for a while, nobody knew what to make of it, and they weren't sure if it was like a Taoist thing. And then they actually read it and realized that it was written by an old friend of ours, Bishop Adam. And it's actually an account written about the year 800, which tells the story of the coming of the luminous doctrine, or what we would call Christianity, to China from round about the, I've got the date wrong here, about the 620s. And it tells the story of the mission. And uh, that is uh, the, uh, as I say, the, it's called the Nestorian Stone. And uh, that, that is, if you like, a, a snapshot of Christianity as it would have been um, in Chang'an, the capital of China, in uh, 800. Put it like this. Christians reached the capital of China round about the time they reached the capital of Anglo-Saxon England. Does that put it in, um, in framework? So what happened to this, uh, this church? Um, 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 by the way, uh, I could talk about this for great length, but uh, I won't because my colleagues are, uh, are going to talk about different aspects of it. They have established this great road between cultural road between East and West. Okay? Ideas flow, documents flow, manuscripts flow. Uh, what flows? Well, in the 7th century, for instance, we have a Church of the East scholar who is doing what they often do, which is making fun of the Greeks. I say, oh, the Greeks think they know everything. Look, the Indians, they've got this great system of counting, and they just use like these ten little symbols, and you can make any number with that. And until you've ever tried to do long division in Roman numerals, uh -huh. you don't understand what a very, very useful thing those numerals are. What do we call them? Oh, yeah, Arabic numerals, for this reason. The Church of the East brings these ideas from the East. <coughs> they are then translated, introduced by, uh, into the Arabic-speaking world under the auspices of uh, Islamic caliphs in the 8th and uh, ninth centuries. And then Europe then takes them aboard later as, this, as if they're the products of Islam and if they're the products of the, uh, uh, the Islamic world. They come through the Islamic world, not from it. Um, when Timothy is not um, writing offhand remarks about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the first Dead Sea Scrolls 1.0, uh, or setting up metropolitans in uh, Tibet, he's translating Aristotle into Arabic, where a few hundred years later it's going to help set off the Renaissance. Um, uh, uh, there is a long story here. Um, there is a point at which these great churches look very much as if they are going to become dominant across Eurasia. They do very well initially under um, Islam. Uh, there, you know, there are no great uh, there are no great uh, uh, tensions. In fact. Um, there is a, um, a, a, a very uh, leading scholar um, who has uh, uh, written at length about the f early interactions of Christians and Muslims. I just wish we had this great scholar here. Oh, yeah, there he is at the end of the row. <laughs> and he will be talking uh, uh, later. But uh, Christians remain a very substantial, well, people debate large minority, maybe majority in different countries for many centuries. 
what finally happens? For me, the real change happens in the 14th century with the great um, climate changes, uh, the great global cooling, uh, the great catastrophes of the 1310s, 1320s, uh, which create a search for scapegoats across um, Europe and Asia. In Europe, they decide that all the ills of the world are the fault of the Jews, and they seek to kill and expel the Jews. In the Middle East, it is the Christians who are blamed. They are very seriously persecuted in Egypt, in uh, Mesopotamia. And it is at that point where Christian numbers, Christian population, Christian prestige goes into free fall, and where Christian numbers are uh, uh, drop sharply to the level that they would remain at pretty much through the, uh, the 20th century. Um, so much of the story of the elimination of these churches is a strictly modern story. It is World War I and after, and of course it's accelerated horribly in modern times. I mentioned these two names, by the way, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans. R real brief description. The Assyrians both represent remnants of the ancient church of the East, right? That church which once spanned from Jerusalem to the Pacific. Um, there are two main branches. One of them was substantially converted to communion with Rome, and they became the Chaldeans. The Assyrians rejected that, but the two groups retained very close connections. And I said, um, I described the power they had, the numbers they had, the scope they had. I think in the whole world today, how many Assyrians and Chaldeans are there combined? Half a million, maybe? I don't know the exact number. I, my, my, my friends here may have different views, we can argue. Uh, but um, trust me, from a church that once controlled half the Christian world to these very small numbers with the, I think, I believe the patriarch of the, um, the Assyrian church, the descendant of Timothy, today lives in Chicago. Um, and uh, that sets off a great many, I suppose, theological issues which is in uh, the New Testament we read uh, Christ's command to uh, go off and make disciples of all nations, but what happens when you make disciples of so many nations and those disciples fall away and those areas are, um, are lost? And that poses countless uh, uh, theological issues which we can uh, think about and, um, and explore. Um, but I, I, um, it, in my... Uh, my book on this uh, uh, topic, I discuss this at some length, and um, I, I end by quoting the words of the great poet uh, uh, Charles Olson, which is the, uh, uh, the most important uh, thing we can do is not let these uh, achievements slip into oblivion. As the phrase goes, the chain of memory is, uh, uh, is resurrection. Uh, let me just move into a couple of um, different uh, ones here. I, I've talked about these uh, great lost cities. If you ever go to Armenia, um, you, you see this, uh, the remains of the city called Ani, uh, which in its day was known as the city of 10,000 churches. And as you see, not many of those churches are left presently. Uh, that is another place which in its day was probably the most populous in uh, Western Asia and is now entirely gone. And I suppose I can't uh, end uh, w with a better image uh, than this. This is um, not for the Syriac churches specifically, but for the, uh, uh, the churches of the East. Uh, th those churches uh, contracted uh, over time. And um, they uh, finally, in uh, uh, May 29, 1453, uh, the forces of the Ottoman Empire took uh, Constantinople. And in the, uh, the Orthodox tradition, that's usually known as the day the world ended. And it's a, 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 memorable, uh, a memorable name. Um, but going back to uh, what I was, uh, I suppose what I was trying to um, introduce here, uh, if you try and tell the story, if you try and tell the culture of Christianity without looking east, you are missing uh, 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 such a crucial part of the uh, uh, of the story. And I I like to think that the more we look at Christianity on a global scale as a religion that is as uh, rooted in Asia and Africa uh, as in Europe, far more so, um, the more I think, th uh, I, I hope that historians will come to regard this not as an optional extra and add-on 
to the Christian story, but something that absolutely has to be there.